Hello, welcome back to Fusion Entertainment. For my next review of the old Universal Monster films, in which I'm just doing the essentials with the limited edition still books. Well, we're going to um, probably one of my favorites. It's a standalone um, Universal Monster movie. This is definitely among my favorite in the franchise. Give me a second here, I got a sneeze. <coughs> yeah, okay, that's it. No worries, just a sneeze, people. Nothing to worry about. And that would be 1932's The Invisible Man. And also might add that out of all abnotations of the H.G. Wells novel, this is the closest there actually is to H.G. Wells' novel, is this movie. Well, let's go ahead and read the synopsis. The plot summary, that's what that means. The signature abnotation of H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man. Stars, Claude Rains is a mysterious scientist who discovers a serum that makes him invisible. Covered by bandages and dark glasses, the scientist arrives in a, at a small English village and attempts to hide his amazing discovery. He soon realizes, however, that the same drug which renders him invisible is slowly driving him insane incapable of committing unspeakable acts of terror. Directed by James Well, the director of Frankenstein. The horror classic features groundbreaking special effects by John P. Floton that inspired many of the techniques that are still used today. And it does. Um, a lot of the techniques to use today are what's called trichnography. Um, what you do is you film a series of series of, of sequences, and then you kind of swipe them together in post production and make one continuous sequence out of many different film film reels, and that's what kind of makes it all look like that. It is still used today. Of course, today you could use it digitally on a computer. Back then, you actually had to get your hands dirty and do more interesting things, but yes, it did inspire in a lot of ways the, the visual effects that we use today, but on a practical level, and it definitely is one of the most impressive visual effects films ever made, in my opinion, is this movie. Well, why do I like this one so much? I like this one so much because I have to be an H.G. Wells fan, but this is a good combination of science fiction and hood or fantasy mixed in with mystery, suspense, and adventure all at the same time. And out of all the Universal Monsters, the one I think you probably root for the most is probably the Invisible Man. I know you would think that Frankenstein or Wolfman. And, you know, Wolfman, I can say just about on the same level is the Invisible Man. It's, you know, that, like I said, all opinions are subjective. I haven't watched The Wolf Man yet. Um, I'm watching that after I review these. The last two films, which includes this one. Um, so my opinion may change. But as it currently stands, this is, in my opinion, the most tragic of them. And when you, and when you, just, you just root for him so much, you actually want him to win, you want him to succeed, instead of our wily victims and our innocents, innocent uh, people out there. You know, you want the Invisible Man to actually win. Also, what I like about the film is there's a lot of humor. Now, that's something that I really like about the Universal Monster films, but Unlike the TV series The Munsters, um, as well as the Hammer Hoarder films, 
TV series The Munsters really make fun of the Universal Monster films. Well, the Hammer Horror films always try to um, reimagine the films, but do it in like a 1960s, 1970s, um, campy, hokey way. What I think that makes the Universal Monster films so interesting is the fact that they can, they can have fun and be a little funny and have com comic relief and, and, you know, kind of silly, quirky acting, while at the same time be gothic and serious and relative. And really doing with a lot of serious steam knowledges and stuff like that, which really separates them from the creature features of the 70s and 60s in the Hammer Holder films of the um, late 50s to early 70s. It really separates these films from, from those. Well, uh, let's talk about the, about the quality. Um, not rated. Although I might have to say that if you were to rate these films today, they probably would be a rated R. Especially if they were made the way that they were back then but with modern technology and stuff like that, definitely. Um, shot in 1.33.1 full frame. It contains the original mono tracks enhanced with DTS HDMA technology. Again, about the same. Um, some of these have better black levels and better details than others. I would say that the Invisible Man looks about as good as the Mummy. But really, they all look just about the same once you get the Frankenstein. The one that really was hard to clean up and they could clean up 110% was um, 31's Dracula. But it's the cleanest that you've, I've ever seen it. Like I said, um, we'll see what they do with the 4K versions. That would be interesting, but definitely not enough of an interest to make me hold off on reviewing these films until next month, as I'm doing them now. And the mono, uh, very cool. Very cool mono. There's a lot of good effects, especially for a mono track when it comes to The Invisible Man, for sure. Performance-wise, very, very cool. And what's cool about the uh, performance from... Um, from Claude Rains is the fact that Claude Rains is all about his voice. It's all about how sinister he can deliver dialogue because you don't actually see him until the very end of the movie and he's dead at the end of the film. And that's when he goes to, from being invisible to visible when he dies. So it's all about his voice, which I think is really cool when you can deliver a performance with voice, much like Boris Karloff delivered a performance with just, you know, his presence playing the Frankenstein monster in 31's Frankenstein. It's opposite of that in 33's, yeah, not 33's, um, The Invisible Man. So um, let's go ahead and take uh, the plastic cover off and kind of show what we're seeing it is. Oh, yeah, that's, that's actually a very cool look right there. I like that. Something I noticed now, but didn't notice before, is you actually have. A science signature right at the bottom here. I believe it was taken from um, from the actors who played the monsters. So that's a signature from um, Claude, Claude um, Rains. So definitely kind of cool. Um, well, that's all there's to say about the Invisible Man for 1933. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you guys next time for my next review. Unfortunately, last for right now because I do have to watch the last two that I do have with the Universal Monster films. And I will apologize now by saying that I could not track down the Phantom of the Opera still book when these came out, unfortunately, and they no longer exist. But I just figured I want something really special to do with these Universal Monsters. I could have gotten that big box set and done a whole month of these movies, but I just want to do the essentials, and I want to show these really beautiful still books off. Because they are very beautiful still books. So I will see you guys next time for my review of 1935's Bride of Frankenstein. Until then.